Runnymede. A water meadow just outside of London. Here, in 1215, King John of England sat down with rebel barons. Between them, an agreement was made on the extent of the king's powers. The agreement came to be known as the Magna Carta. Literally translating as Great Paper, Magna Carta appeared to lay down many rules, including important limitations on the power of the king, and the right not to be imprisoned or punished without operation of law. But how important is the Magna Carta? How can an agreement that took place on a riverbank nearly a thousand years ago be said to be of any relevance today? I decided to visit Runnymede to find out more about this historic document. At the site of Runnymede, there are numerous monuments and installations established in honour of the Magna Carta. This art installation is called Writ in Water. Created by the artist Mark Wallinger, it presents us with perhaps the most famous clause of the Magna Carta, Clause 39, which has been suspended in water. Clause 39 reads, No free man shall be seized or imprisoned, or stripped of his rights or possessions, or outlawed or exiled, or deprived of his standing in any way. Nor will we proceed with force against him, or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals, or by the law of the land. These very words were said by the great Lord Bingham, to have the power to make the blood race. The Magna Carta has undoubtedly caused some ripples in the law. The ripples caused by the Magna Carta on the global stage can be seen not far from written water. The American Bar Association's Magna Carta Memorial. Built in 1957, this memorial shows the influence of the Magna Carta on the United States of America. This can be seen in the United States Declaration of Independence and the broader constitution, along with the constitutions of various states. Line 12 of North Carolina's constitution from 1776 is a particularly strong example of this. Line 12, that no free man ought to be taken, imprisoned, or differized of his freehold, liberties, or privileges, or outlawed, or exiled, or in any manner destroyed, or deprived of his life, liberty, or property, but 
by the law of the land. Even though there are many monuments here, nowhere marks the exact spot where the Magna Carta was sealed. Where did this happen? One candidate for the exact spot lies at the end of Magna Carta Lane at Runnymede. Magna Carta Island. It has been doubted whether this house is indeed on the exact spot. And the truth is that we will probably never know for sure. However, I know a place where I can see an actual copy of the Magna Carta itself. The city of Lincoln. Lincoln's copy of the Magna Carta is located within Lincoln Castle, at the top of the appropriately named Steep Hill. Lincoln is one of the UK's most celebrated and historically significant cities. also my home for five years. Lincoln's copy of the Magna Carta is locked away inside a specially built multi-million pound vault deep within the castle grounds. Unfortunately, photography and video recording of the Magna Carta itself is not allowed. Fortunately, I have the next best thing. Replica purchased from the gift shop. The original Magna Carta was written in Latin on parchment and contained 63 clauses on a range of matters. The parts of it that remain in force today can be found in the Magna Carta 1297, which also includes aspects of other charters including the 1217 Charter of the Forest. But is the Magna Carta of 1215 really such an important document? To learn more, I met with friend and former colleague Robin Sisson, a lecturer in history and graduate of the University of Cambridge. The Magna Carta has entered into the mythology of um, the world's history uh, in terms of it being a great legal, constitutional framework. However, historians have actually identified that there were a number of issues or, or myths associated with the Magna Carta. Uh, one of those is that this in some way was as a groundbreaking or new development, a king making this statement about the rule of law and the relationship of the king to that. However, going back probably at least a thousand years before that, there were clear statements in which a king ruled through the establishment of the rule of law. Uh, even John's father, Henry II, who was fundamental in establishing um, the groundwork of English common law as a detached from um, divine rights of, of kings or, or that kind of thing um, not simply stated the importance of the law another possible myth about the Magna Carta is that it was a great democratic statement or um, a framework deliberately based on um, creating some kind of constitutional framework for government and it wasn't it was a peace treaty it was um, an effort by a group of aristocrats, the nobility, who had got into conflict with King John. King John is regarded as a generally terrible king, a cruel king, but that wasn't unusual in this period. Kings and nobility were cruel, they could be tyrannical, but the problem with John is that he was unpredictable, he was unjust to the point where the nobility felt that they couldn't maintain a relationship with him, and it went into civil war. 
And even Article 39, the famous article identifying that no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights, which is seen as a great statement of democratic rights of man, of ordinary people against unjust rulers, is barely democratic as we'd see it now when we talk about free man within this context. We're talking about property owners. Less than 50% of the population, possibly less than 20% of the population. And if you look at the rest of the Magna Carta, far from it being a great statement of constitutional law, it's a whole hodgepodge of different ideas and attitudes to do with complaints against the king. So much of that has nothing to do with um, universal practices. It's to do with uh, fishing in the Thames. It's to do with um, Londoners and their rights to trade. Some of it actually reduces the rights. There's a statement within that that takes away some of the rights that women had in terms of their ability to accuse people of murder. Another issue with the Magna Carta of 1215, which is a copy of which is held at Lincoln uh, Castle, is that it actually doesn't last more than a, a few months. Uh, it is utterly, seen as utterly unacceptable by uh, King John. He's only signed it under duress, and there's a very clear sense he's only signed it in order to get out of a sticky situation with the nobility. The moment he is away from Runnymede, uh, he meets up with the nobility again in Oxford, and he feels humiliated, and he writes to the Pope, who sends a, a papal bull denouncing the Magna Carta. One of the most controversial aspects of the Magna Carta isn't the statement that the king should follow the rule of law, which, as we've said, has been long established, but the fact that within the Magna Carta, the nobility attempt to enforce that through a council of 25 nobles. And this is um, an important legacy, historically. It's all very well and good having a set of guidelines or a charter, but unless you have some way of enforcing it with teeth, it's essentially an empty document. So as I said, almost as soon as it had been written, King John totally rejects the Magna Carta. And in fact, the only reason why it survives is because a year later, King John dies. And his infant son, nine years old, comes to the throne, King Henry III. And it becomes uh, apparent that actually Magna Carta could be a useful way of restoring order and preventing the end of, of civil war. And so they take out the more controversial bits of the Magna Carta and then this restatement of um, the relationship between the king, the nobility and the rest of, of the country, the commons, could actually be a way of stabilising government and harmony. So that's one of the reasons why it survives, this recognition that actually a written statement could be a valuable way of maintaining stability of government. Another reason why we still know about it is that as soon as it was written, multiple copies of it were made out of which one is at Lincoln, and they're distributed throughout the kingdom by the clergy, by members of the church. And from there it enters uh, beyond the control of the king into something which ordinary people can use, and it enters into the life and world and imagination of lawyers. So going as early as the 13th century, early copies of law books have the Magna Carta at their, their beginning, and within um, cases within um, trials, ordinary people are using the Magna Carta as a way of defending their rights. And in some ways, that shows the failings of the Magna Carta, because throughout the centuries after this, it keeps getting brought up, which shows us that actually kings are ignoring it, they are breaching it. So this statement of the king's um, obligations and rule of law are being broken. But on the other hand, we now have a document which allows people to call the king to account. We know that the king shouldn't be doing this, even if they are. You know, I actually uh, visited Runnymede at the, the new year, uh, and I must admit I was uh, quite struck by the beauty of the place. Do you know why it was that they decided to choose that particular area? Yes, I mean, the, the, the decision to locate the, the meeting for Magna Carta at Runnymede was a very conscious decision, and it tells you a lot about the reasons why Magna Carta were being signed and why this was being negotiated. With it being in a meadow, 
with the stream with the Thames on one side um, and it being close to Windsor Castle, part of this was so that John, who was frightened for his life, would stay in Windsor Castle, come out for a discussion, whereas the barons had captured London, were based in Staines, and they actually occupied the site of Runnymede and turned it into a fortified camp. And so they chose Runnymede because neither side trusted each other and it was ideally located so you couldn't uh, surprise, ambush each other and, and, and kidnap or kill each other. So in many ways, the importance of the Magna Carta isn't in the document itself at the time, but the fact that it becomes part of the common knowledge and approach of lawyers. So by the time you get round to the 17th century in the English Civil War, parliamentarians are able to use the Magna Carta, and particularly that famous Article 39, in order to make a statement that was never really intended at the time about uh, the rights of individuals against tyrants, against rulers, against the state, and to fundamentally rethink how a state should be governed and relationship between rulers and the people. And those ideas and that imagination, that, that narrative, is then taken with much gusto um, when people settle in America. And in America, the idea of the Magna Carta takes on a much greater importance in many ways, a great, much greater significance than it's had in England as a cornerstone of how a country should be governed and the importance of a constitution within that. So the Magna Carta, which starts as effectively a failed peace treaty, turns into something in the American imagination, which becomes the bedrock of constitutional government. Whatever one's thoughts are on the Magna Carta of 1215, it is clear that it is neither a sacred constitutional framework, nor is it an obscure and meaningless ancient document. Its enduring legacy should perhaps be one of accountability and enforcement, rather than as any great declaration of individual freedom. The ideas that it has come to represent down the years are important, and should not be forgotten. And now it's time for Rory Mayo's Top Tips. Rory Mayo's Top Tips. The Magna Carta 1297 is still partially enforced today. It can even be accessed at legislation.gov.uk. Simply search for Magna Carta and you will be taken to it.